We're getting close to the day when it'll be routine to have one of these in your body instead of the heart you were born with. Or to have replacement parts like cartilage or liver grown to order for you in one of these. On this edition of Scientific American Frontiers, science figures out how to re-engineer our bodies. We'll see how synthetic nerves can free the disabled from their wheelchairs. We'll look at artificial hearts and tell the story behind the news. We'll show how one day damaged retinas could be restored. And then these lighter parts. Just a little drop. So now this and we'll meet the scientist who's starting to make a miniature human body on a laboratory bench. We could take stem cells and make a liver, make a heart, make a brain. I'm Alan Alda. Join me now as we try some bodybuilding. Don Crago is paralyzed from the waist down, but using artificial electrical muscle stimulation, he can walk. Dr. Byron Marcellet started this project. He has absolutely no control of his legs at all. He is totally and completely paralyzed, and or every bit of motion that happens is coming uh, through the electrical stem. Don, you get all your balance from holding on to this uh, yes, walker? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And, uh, uh, Does that yeah. put a lot of pressure on your arms? No, not really. Uh, most of the pressure is on my legs. Um, actually, I, I prefer to let my legs do the work uh -huh. because uh, if I did with my arms, then uh, I would be tired out. Yeah. How tiring is it to take it, uh, every step? Uh, not too bad. It's uh, it's comfortable, you know. But uh, after the end of the walk, I, I will breathe heavy. <laughs> yeah. Standing takes a lot of energy because you have to uh, stimulate the muscles for a prolonged period. Right. He's he is standing by uh, stimulating the flexors and the extensors, the antagonistic muscles all at the same time. Right. So he's stiff as a board. And that charge just has to be constant, it's right? Constantly. If you let up on it, he's liable to tip one way or another. Oh, he would, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so he, he, he looks good standing tall yeah. and stiff. Yeah. Uh, but you feel a strain? But, but he's got uh, strain. Yeah, yeah, I can feel <laughs> strain. My introduction to the Functional Electrical Stimulation, or FES, program was 10 years ago. Now what I'm trying to get is this gluteus maximus muscle. A big seat muscle. Dr. Marcellet showed me how he implants wire electrodes. What no. you're inserting into the muscle is that's not the electrode itself. Right? No, no, this is just a little probe. Right. A very tiny probe. Which... And, and the reason you're doing this is to see if you can get the muscle to react to, uh, to give its greatest response? Exactly. Want... And I want just the right muscle. That's the muscle that we want. It goes right down here into the femur, yeah. which is the big leg bone. And you see how it's beginning to jump there? It's starting to do what we want. I think I can do better. And, the, and in order to do better, I have to get it right beside the nerve. Dan Kemp, paralyzed in a car accident, is on the table. Now, I think Dr. Marcelli looks like he's found mm -hmm. the spot here. Mm -hmm. That looks pretty good. Now, yeah. what was this? That's it's getting a pretty good tight. Yeah, I can, I can see it. See how that jerks things together there. And so it looks like about an inch and a half from where you were first searching for it. Yes, that's that's right. We're, uh, although we're angled a bit down, we started about here, and now we're, we're about here, but so we were a good inch away. Once he's found the best stimulation point for the muscle, a hair-thin permanent wire implant is slid into place. Dan was one of many experimental subjects who volunteered for the program. In his case, he received eight electrodes in each leg. Major. Now we just bring this down to exactly the position that we were before. The patients and Dr. Marcellet were literally stepping into the unknown. How do you feel when you're going through this? You feel a little bit like a guinea pig? Yeah, I do, but it's, uh, it's well worth it. You know. Down the road, people will be able to look back and 
say if it wasn't for people like me that they wouldn't have got as far as they got in the new procedures. So it's, you know, it goes down the line. Yeah. Everybody helps everybody else, whether they realize it or not. Eric Bellamy, paralyzed in a motorbike accident, agreed with Dan that it was worth being a guinea pig. He saw simple, basic ambitions for himself and for the program. Uh, I see being in a chair always, but I see uh, being able to go, go up steps and, and knock on the friend's door, say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm down here. Uh, instead of running around the house and screaming, you know, telling the guy, hey, I'm here, I'm here. Uh, I see even convenience stores, one step, you know. Uh, so being able to get up and go through this uh, narrow door to get into the bathroom, uh, just, just for them answers. And, that, and if they come with that right there, just your life's in a chair, but being able to overcome difficulties would be uh, a tremendous step. And that's what we're working on right now. Eric was one of five volunteers who received the most complex of the experimental systems, with a total of 40 implanted and eight external electrodes. The computerized control box could handle 48 electrodes simultaneously, with connections made through the skin on his thigh. One big goal was to establish how many muscles needed to be stimulated for effective standing and walking. Working out how to sequence the firing of the electrodes was another challenge. Okay, go ahead, stand up. There. In this trial, 20 muscles per leg were being stimulated compared to the 50 per side that are involved in natural walking. Eric was able to walk relatively smoothly, although he still needed to use his arms to balance. Developing an artificial balance mechanism is still one of the goals, but they have been able to reduce the number of muscles needed for walking to only eight per side, as in the latest system we saw Don Crago using earlier. But Eric's muscles had to work constantly at full blast. They're using tremendous amounts of muscle mass. Their quadriceps are on 100%, their gluteal muscles are on 100%, their hamstring muscles are on 100%, their back muscles, Everything's just blasted. Whenever they do something, they're using 100% of all their strength. Whether it's one step, two steps, they're using everything they got. Uh, like when you stand, they, everything goes right into it. 100%, bam. Okay. With tough, motivated subjects like Eric, they were eventually able to work out how to reduce the high levels of muscle stimulation, and they also figured out the best design philosophy. It's that simpler is better. They realized that even the most complex systems were going to get tripped up by the real world sometimes. Better instead to go for simpler standard systems that can bring basic benefits to the largest number of people quickly. Many of the pioneers in FES research have now dropped out. Eric got a bad infection. Dan couldn't keep up the long commutes to the hospital. But today, many people with spinal cord injuries have good reason to be thankful for the pioneers' efforts. This is a, a, an easy introduction to the real world, I guess you could say. Jen Panko, who was made paraplegic in a snowboarding accident, is one of the beneficiaries. She's showing me a rehab area at Cleveland Metro Medical Center, the first of three centers around the country to be working with the simplified standard systems. For instance, there's curb cuts and those types of things. That takes a little extra energy to get up that, doesn't it? Uh, a little bit. But, um, you know, it's nothing. You'll, you'll get curbs in the real world that are a lot more difficult than that. You can just set it right there, because I'll get myself set up. Yeah. Jen has a simplified system that does just one thing. Allows her to stand. So the light that by the stand means that it's ready to stand? And all I need to do is press this button to go, and it will stand. Ready? Yeah. Are you sure you're yeah, ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh. Jen's system has only four implanted electrodes per side, but that allows her to stand and get around just enough to really make a difference. So here I can reach up grab window cleaner and hand it over to you. How long can you stand before you start to feel stressed out or you're breathing heavily? We did a test I, on that. 
33 minutes and 8 seconds was my time breaker right now. So, and that was a few weeks ago, so. Usually when you're in a grocery store, one of the tough things when you're in a wheelchair mm -hmm. is you can't really see within these big bins. Yeah. So that way you can reach over, pick up some Weight Watchers, because Lord knows I need it. And you can start to see things from a standing level that you really can't see from a sitting level. Whereas without, if I was in a sitting level, I'd be lucky if I'd be able to see what was actually in here. Do you want to go to walking? Is that, is that something you have in mind? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, to be able to ambulate is fantastic. I mean, just to be able to stand, we, we're, we're focusing on the functional things, but there's a lot of health benefits to standing yeah. as well. I mean, um, people that are in wheelchairs that don't stand, you have problems with um, the shortening of muscles, with osteoporosis, with circulation. So you have to be able to get into pretty much any kind of a seat. Simply transferring from one seat to another is a big benefit. Handle an automobile seat and a booth like this, which is different from a chair. Right. One, two, three. Hmm. Those are three slow seconds. They are. And um, considering I'm from the Boston area, I had to learn how to count a lot slower. <laughs> Than out here, so it took me a long time to learn how to count. They, they count slower in Cleveland. Huh? I guess they do. Another part of the design philosophy is modularity. If Jan and her doctors decide everything is working well, she can get another eight electrode implants, which will allow her to walk. Now sit. So you have the same three seconds before it puts you in the seated position. Mm -hmm. Same audio that goes through as well. Uh -huh. Same beeping cycle. Yeah. So it's just like a habit. Training me like a mouse. Yeah. There you go. Beep. Three seconds later, beep, yeah. and I'm standing up. Hey, what do you call the thing that's implanted? What is that? It's my receiver. Yeah. It's How big is it? Um, it's about, about that big. It's not very big at all. Okay. A big change with the standard systems is that no wires pass through the skin, like with the Abiomed artificial heart. So this is the box that holds the batteries, right. holds the software and the circuit boards. Mm -hmm. Instead, there's a transmitting coil with an implanted receiver. There's the coil that goes to my receiver. I have it taped onto the skin so it won't move. Nice. So I have this coil that sends the radio waves to the, to the receiver that's right here. And you see the little bump in the skin mm -hmm. right there? That's the receiver. There are now nearly 200 standard systems in use, but research is continuing. Jim Jadich received the very first implanted electrodes in 1986 to allow his left hand to grip. Since I had this implant, once it's put on me in the morning, I'm on my own and I can write for myself, feed myself, uh, answer the phone, take messages, work on a computer. I do engineering drawings on a computer. I'm trying to start my own business doing well, that. And that, that would have been out of the question, I, right? I mean, right. without a tremendous amount of help. When we met Jim in 1993, he'd already been an FES research subject for 15 years, helping to try out new systems. Back then, for example, they were perfecting a joystick controller for the eight electrodes that give him his hand grip. The joystick was attached to his right shoulder, so a quick shrug of the shoulder activates the grip. then a double shrug relaxes it. Jim was also one of the first to try an implanted receiver so no wires penetrate the skin. Today, Jim is trying another experimental control system. What we have is like a joystick implanted in the bones of my wrist. There's a magnet and a sensor and as the wrist bones pass each other, that sends a signal to the implant. And depending at what angle I'm at, whatever is programmed into the computer and back of my wheelchair, that's how much strength and how fast my hand closes. So the magnet and the sensor, depending on how far apart they are as you move your hand back, that regulates 
uh, everything that's going to happen right here. Jim and the researchers have been working with the implanted magnet control for a couple of years. Now, if that were full of coffee and heavy... Uh, hey, here, let's see how strong I'm holding it. Is oh, it... yeah, you have a really good grip on that. Yeah. Yeah. You're a good actor, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looked like you had something in there. It's good. Oh, it's hot. <laughs> With the magnets controlling his left hand, Jim's joystick can now control a new implant system in his right hand. So he'll be working with the researchers on tasks that need two hands simultaneously. Jim's essentially a member of the research team, but one perhaps with a special perspective on the benefits of the FES program. You know, I've talked to friends of mine that are paralyzed. They won't go into restaurants when we have meetings, you know, like a support group meeting, yeah. because they can't feed themselves. They don't, they don't want to see anyone feeding them so whenever we have meetings in a, in a hospital or something they show up yeah. but when we have in a restaurant they won't go because someone has to feed them you know so, so there's a there's a there's a series of things that don't get done because of a simple thing like not being able to pick up a fork not being, i mean you get less social that's right an example is a uh, a girl that came into this uh, project to get an implant. Mm -hmm. When she first came in, you know, she her face was down, she wouldn't talk to anyone, mm -hmm. no eye contact. Mm -hmm. You know, after she got the implant, she's, you know, feeding herself, going out to restaurants, she enrolled back in school. Now she's an advocate, talking to everyone about it. She started a support group. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, it just changes people's lives. And that's the kick I get out of it, to see how people change. you'll recognize the radiant young bride moving down the aisle. Still not quite walking, but she's getting there. It's Jen Penko, and that's her dad by her side. A year after we filmed her in Cleveland, Jen married her longtime sweetheart, Tim. Jen made it to the altar standing tall under her own steam, thanks to her basic standing FES implant. She doesn't yet have her walking system. We have gathered in the presence of God to witness the joining together of Jennifer Penko and Tim French, and in the celebration of God's greatest gift, the gift of love. A love that abides and grows through difficulty and trial. This, you see, has been Tim and Jennifer's experience over the past three years, of facing injury, months of painful therapy, healing, and renewal, and has led to the miracle of Jennifer walking down the aisle this day. For those moments, I totally forgot that I was wheelchair-bound, Jen told us later. It was a moment in our lives that we would never forget, of accomplishment for achieving something that we had worked toward for so long. For that time, I wasn't disabled. All the negative sides of disability disappeared to be replaced with the gifts of abilities, she said. It would be hard to imagine a more vivid demonstration of the benefits of another kind of marriage, the new marriage of biology and engineering that this program has been about. Come visit us at PBS Online. Scientific American Frontiers can be found on the World Wide Web at pbs.org or America Online, keyword P.